We're going to be talking about a Bloomberg NEF article called The Extraordinary Rise of Electric Cars in Developing Countries. So, Colin, um, give me an overview of why EVs are surging in the global south in the emerging economies. Yeah, it's essentially an economic story. So for a long time, the uh, EV adoption story was really led out of wealthy countries and starting at the high end of the market. So premium vehicles for the most um the, the buyers with the most capability then slowly working its way down. And that's essentially because of price elasticity of demand. So if you think about that, that's essentially because buyers in emerging economies are more price sensitive. They're not going to spend a lot of money on something um, that they can have a, a substitute for uh, that with similar performance. Now, what that price elasticity of demand means is that while EVs are slower to be adopted in the period where they're more expensive, they're going to be faster to be adopted in the period where they are cheaper than combustion cars. And we are at the very beginning of that period now. So you already see vehicles competitive on a total cost of ownership basis in a lot of cases, and in some cases, even competitive on an upfront basis. That's why you saw sales in China really take off. They're over 50% of sales now because electric vehicles got cheaper than comparable combustion vehicles to at the point of purchase. So really, it's an economics-led argument. Emerging economies are going electric because it is a cheaper way to deliver mobility. Colin, what role does China play in this? I mean, we've all seen the stories about manufacturing over capacity and batteries in electric vehicles, and China seems to be flooding the, uh, the global south markets uh, with these uh, low, uh, inexpensive EVs. Yeah, so China is a huge part of this. If you look at all of the emerging economies around the world and look at the ones that have the highest rates of EV adoption, they are generally the ones that are open to Chinese manufacturers. And a lot of people might be surprised to realize this, but the EV adoption rate in some of these emerging economies is already higher than you see in some wealthy economies, say the US or Japan. So for example, uh, you have very high EV adop adoption rates in countries like Nepal, in Southeast Asia, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Turkey, uh, in Ethiopia. Again, the common thread running through that is that Chinese automakers who have now, in some cases, saturated their addressable market in, the, in their home country are now looking at where they can sell vehicles abroad. They have a lot of manufacturing capacity. There's a full battery supply chain built, and they are now starting to try to break into other markets and doing it quite successfully. I should say they're not only doing it with electric vehicles. You are also seeing a fair amount of combustion and plug-in hybrid vehicles being sold by these Chinese automakers abroad. But in many, in most countries, the 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 EV is kind of the the entry point uh, for for those vehicles. What about setting up local manufacturing and assembly? That seems to be a big part of China's strategy. It is, and you're starting to see um, more countries push back and say, "We don't just want to be vehicle import vehicle importers." So we're going to put restrictions on that, or in some cases, they already had them, and that's designed to onshore the manufacturing of either both batteries, or either vehicles or batteries or both. Um, so for example, you're seeing BYD setting up in markets like uh, Brazil and they'll have a plant up, they have a plant up and running their former Ford plant um, that will be producing vehicles for the local market. You're seeing them set up in Thailand, uh, a number of other markets. So the Chinese automakers have started with an export strategy, but are very much seeing it as uh, a route in, which is then followed by assuming there's high enough uptake by local manufacturing uh, to help help them with uh, navigate this complex tariff ridden world that we now live in as well. Now it's easy to see, you know, high uh, adoption rates in countries like Nepal or Costa Rica, which are fa fairly small populations. But what about some of the bigger ones in the uh, in the emerging economies like India? Yeah, I mean, Mar and Brazil too. Brazil's a really interesting one to look at. About 8% of all vehicle sales in Brazil this year will be electric. Um, again, really driven by the Chinese automakers. And that's uh, that's about comparable with where the U.S. is. The U.S. is at about 10% right now, but it's going to drop in Q4 because of the removal of tax credits. So um, India is also really interesting in that right now you have this real mix of automakers there. You have Chinese automakers who do face an import tariff in the, in the Indian market. But even with that import tariff, they're still competitive. You have the Indian manufacturers quickly launching new, more competitive EV models. And then you have the international automakers, groups like Hyundai and others that are, are seeing that as an as a important growth market. So India, compared to its population, is still a relatively small vehicle market, just relative to the sheer size of the country. But it's sort of widely known that that's where a lot of the vehicle growth will be in the next decades, along with Southeast Asia. And in markets like Thailand and Vietnam, you're also seeing really high EV adoption. Vietnam's an interesting case. A lot of that adopt, adoption is driven by a homegrown automaker 
in fast who's producing electric vehicles as well. So you have this mix of uh, industrial competition and sort of strategic competition for the for the industries of the future, combined with um, this this element of just what's the cheapest way to get mobility to the people in a given country. Um, it's very clear to me that China has disrupted the global auto industry. What's interesting is that per, uh, perception, that uh, that understanding hasn't filtered down to North America yet. Uh, maybe you could just explain how severely the global auto industry, the, the legacy automakers, how severe the disruption is. So most of the, particularly the European automakers and of that particularly the German automakers, all, all, pretty much all of their growth of the last 20 years is fueled from China. So it was this huge middle class that was pulled out of poverty, became a, 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 the largest auto market in the world. The German automakers and, and to a lesser extent, some of the others did very, very well out of that. Now they are all getting squeezed out of the Chinese market because they have maintained their share in the combustion vehicle part of the Chinese market, but that's now half of the market and the other half is electric and they have not maintained their market share in that electric part. That has been really dominated by domestic brands, not just state-owned, enter, former state-owned enterprises, but uh, or state-controlled enterprises rather, but also uh, new newer companies. Companies. So that has really shaken what was a big part of their sort of three pillared stool of where their profits were coming from in North America, Europe, um, and, and China. And now there's a lot of them have more capacity, production capacity than they need, which is a real problem in the auto business. Having too much capacity costs a lot of money. And it has been historically one of the big things that caused major financial problems for automakers. Having too much capacity, not enough markets to serve is a, is a real problem. And you're beginning to see the correction of that. I don't think all of the automakers are going to stay in China, as an example. Um, I, I think a lot of them are going to realize they're not competitive there. They're losing money there. And they will probably at least a few of them will probably exit in the next three or four years. I think what's so that I think is already that ship has already sailed, if you will. I think what's interesting to watch next is what happens in those other emerging economies, whether the international automakers decide, no, actually, we can't exit all of these international markets. We need to make a stand in a few of them. So particularly Latin America, Southeast Asia, India is the ones I'm watching there uh, to see what what sort of position they take. We are starting to see finally more competitive EV models from the established automakers that look like they can maybe go head to head with some of the Chinese ones, but not in all segments. So really interesting time ahead. It has been disruptive and the existing automakers are under threat. Quick question on global oil demand. How will the electrification of transportation affect global oil demand, particularly between now and 2030? So what we have been tracking for a long time is when do you get material oil displacement from electric vehicles? And right now, the total electric vehicle fleet of all types is displacing, and that's buses, commercial vehicles, passenger vehicles, and two and three wheelers. It's displacing about 2 million barrels per day. Most of that in the past up to now has been driven by two and three wheelers and buses, but passenger cars is becoming quite big or becoming material in the next little while as well, because you've now got sort of 60, 70, 80 million passenger EVs on the road globally by the end of this year. We think um, that global road transport oil demand peaks around 2029, and, and that's mostly just based around this fact that combustion vehicle sales peaked um, in 2017. So we're now uh, eight years past that peak, and that will start to flow through to the fleet. So the combustion vehicle fleet will keep growing for another few years, then it'll be about 10 years since that peak of sales, and then the combustion vehicle fleet starts to come down towards the end of the 2020s, and that really leads to a peak in gasoline and diesel demand. That's different from a peak in total oil demand, because you can still have things like aviation, shipping, petrochemicals, and other areas still growing. But the part I'm very focused on is road transport. Places like China, you've already seen um, the major fuel distributors, groups like Sinopec, saying, actually, we think gasoline demand has already peaked. There's been a view for a long time, or, or is peaking this year. Uh, there's been a view a long time that diesel will keep growing for for indefinitely in some some group size. I think that's under threat a little bit too. You're about seeing a, a large rise in the number of heavy commercial electric vehicles being sold, which will start to eat into diesel demand as well. So we're probably looking at a peak uh, this this decade, but it doesn't mean there's a sharp drop afterwards. Right now, it looks more like a, a rounded peak rather than a very sharp one. Colin, thank you very much for this. Thanks, Markham. Nice to speak to you.